So it turns out that there are lots of people who are wrong on the internet. And uh, worse than that, there are lots of people who are my people who are wrong on the internet. You know, developers, front-end engineers, interactive developers. You know, these people that I read every day, and they come out with crazy opinions, mostly on Twitter, because that's where I go. So the, oh, so the issue with Twitter is that uh, 280 characters is a constraint, and you can't say anything interesting in 280 characters unless you say it in a very context-free way. Um, and we'll get to that in a little while. So I'll introduce you to four of my favorite opinions. Oh, no. First, I'll give you my obligatory biography. So, so you know that I might know a little thing or two about what I'm talking about. I did a philosophy degree many years ago at Edinburgh University, and then I became a qualified mathematics teacher because nobody gets paid for being a philosophy graduate. Uh, I became a software engineer, and I ended up going to California, and I worked at YouTube, and I worked at Google for Firebase, and then I came home, and now I'm working at a company called KPV Lab, um, where I'm the principal developer, and KPV Lab is company you probably haven't heard of unless you've talked to me. Um, we're in stealth mode, uh, so there will be things that you'll uh, see out in the media in, in the next year or two, I hope. I'm going to look at my boss. Yeah? Yeah. In the next year or two. Um, and I hope you'll like them. An opinion. JavaScript's main problem feature is that it is dynamic. TypeScript is better, worse. Than JavaScript. Uh, delete as, as applicable. I didn't want to give you which opinion uh, you hold, but you hold one of them probably, and you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and because we like to be um, angry with each other, we write memes about how wrong the other people are. Another one test driven development is dead or critical. Also, unit tests are pointless or necessary. And we don't like the people who hold the opposite opinion to this either. They really don't know what they're talking about. And we make memes. <laughs> That's a particularly good meme. And there's a... There's a yeah. <laughs> oh, and we make memes the other way too. Upfront design saves or wastes time, depending on who you ask. Technical debt is a product of progress or failure, depending on who you ask. It seems that both opinions are held, binarily. There doesn't seem to be any gray area on the internet, which is curious. And we make memes about those, too. Though they're starting to get a little bit more obscure, so I made more of them slightly further away. So. <laughs> the memes themselves didn't matter quite so much. And the one that will be dear to all of your hearts, uh, I did tell you that I worked for Google, so I have a steep and, uh, a deep and thorough knowledge of Angular. And I'm standing in front of a React crowd. So React is better slash worse than Angular. I wonder if there are any worse people in the audience? No? No one will admit to it. Or view or something else, entity component system or whatever, whatever the hell you want to put in. And we make memes about those two. So, yeah, your opinions are wrong if you hold these, which I suspect some of you do or at least did and probably wouldn't admit to now. Um, and they're wrong because any opinion like that is wrong unless you contextually constrain them. Uh, and that's what I really want to talk to you about. So, in 2018, I went to see Kent Beck give a talk in London at Facebook. And Kent Beck is uh, one of the founding fathers of modern computer programming. If you don't know, he was one of the, the signatories of the Agile movement. He invented extreme programming, which is the idea that you only ever write a piece of production code if uh, you have a failing test, which it makes pass. Um, so, about as out there, TDD, um, do things the right way as you can possibly imagine, grew up and came to prominence in the object-oriented programming Java um, 
paradigm. Um, and he joined Facebook um, in something like 2015, 14, and he went through all the um, induction, and there were a bunch of 20-year-old kids there, he's in his 60s, or 50s, anyway, um, and there's a bunch of 20-year-old kids there, and they were doing it all wrong. Everything they did went against everything that he had written books about, and he knew a thing or two, because he'd written books about this stuff. Um, but the annoying thing was that they were remarkably successful in what they were doing. And so, being Kent Beck, he didn't just sit in a corner and think, why are these people wrong? He tried to understand why it is that his opinion and their opinion seemed to be so disparate. And he came up with this, which is his sinusoid of software development. He called it, he, he gave the, the sinusoid three labels, which helps kind of get to grips with what it is. So, um, explore, expand, and extract. So I'll try to describe what's, what this means in a little more detail using these hooks. At the start of a project, you don't have much written, you don't know, you don't have any users, you don't know quite what your thing is going to do yet. You're in an explore phase. There are very uh, huge amounts of freedoms and very few constraints. Um, when you find an audience, you start to make a product and you start to become successful, he argues, then what you need to do at that point is start to scale that product. Get as many people using it as you can. Become as successful as you can. So you move out of the ex explore phase into the expand phase. And then you get to, hopefully, you get to the, the scale of a billion users or a hundred million users or whatever your ceiling number of users is. Excuse me. Um, and you kind of exit the expand phase and you enter the extract phase. And the extract phase, you're not really going to do massive amounts more development there. You're not going to create new innovative features particularly. Innovative features would come in another application that maybe links to this. But, but this is really just a maintenance now. You want to keep the users you've got keep them using it for as long as you can, respond to any competitors who come in the field, make as much money as you can to uh, pay off the investment cost of all the previous phases. So, what he, his insight, and the insight that I'm essentially piggybacking on uh, to talk to you today, is that different rules apply at different stages of development. And that he had grown up and come to prominence in in his terms, uh, enterprise applications that were relatively in the extract phase. So, had lots of constraints, big complex systems, um, making a mistake had big consequences, um, very hard to make changes well. So, test-driven development, um, thoughtful, careful planning. But, these guys at Facebook were still working in a kind of explore phase. They were, they were writing code super fast, trying things, throwing it away. You know, they wouldn't care if they spent three weeks or two months writing a piece of code and then decide that it was a wasted experiment and just literally throw it away and start again line one. Even if there was 40% overlap, they didn't care. They just thought that that was a, a better way to work. And this blew his mind. But he came up with this. And I like this. Um, when I think about it, I reframe it slightly. So I'm gonna reframe it slightly. I'm going to reframe it in terms of freedoms and constraints. Um, so when I, this is a kind of as close to my mental model that I was able to write down uh, in, in the time that I had. Um, and roughly speaking, let's think of it like this. Um, at the start of a project, you're in the explore phase, you have almost no constraints. But you have, uh, you have quite a lot of freedoms relative to those constraints. Anyway, you have quite a lot of freedoms, but you don't have like, unbounded freedom because there's just one or two or three of you. So um, you have this small amount of constraints, um, uh, of freedoms. And as your application grows, it goes through some change. And at the time when you get to success, what you will have inevitably is a highly constrained system which if you change it and break it, you're in trouble. Um, so massive numbers of constraints, depending on how well you've done, relatively few or uh, uh, freedoms. 
And the development process looks like this. I started to write it as a graph, then I realized it was a tree, and I didn't have time to reorganize it because you can't group in the app that I was using. So uh, just run with this, this is a tree. Um, kind of goes from the bottom left to the top right. Um, and you get to make choices. Every time we write code, every time we write anything, we make a choice that changes this balance. We can write a piece of really shitty code that adds a whole bunch of constraints to the system and doesn't really help us very much. Or we can write the perfect piece of code that doesn't add constraints to the system at all and just opens up avenues for people to build more stuff on top of you. And normally some on top of that work. And normally something between those two, some balance between them. And different choices uh, have different effects. So in an explore paradigm, we might think that trying some of these is a good idea. Because it's very hard to see ahead what's going to work, what's, go what's going to be successful, what isn't. So we can, we can do a breadth first search on this tree and, and follow lots of branches. But as we get to a more constrained scenario, we can think of it as though the cost of traveling along each edge on this tree goes up and up and up. So you're going to need to plan ahead. You're going to need to think about it. You have to be careful. You don't get to try multiple branches. You get to try one or maybe two. Um, so the nature of your development changes. You turn, turn from a breadth first search to more of a depth first search. I like this model. I'm going to try and read this slide. Uh, I don't like reading slides, but I'm going to do this one because I want to get it right. Um, so the model is useful because it gives us a structure in which to evaluate our context. Um, so we have opinions, but these opinions are grounded in a context, and the context is hard to get, get a hold of sometimes. And this is one model, my model, uh, for how we might contextualize these opinions. Oh yeah, quick sidebar. I read this article, The TypeScript Tax, by Eric Elliott. I'm, I'm sure he's a very clever guy. He, he wrote as though he was a very clever guy, but it felt like he fell into a trap. And the trap was that he is obsessed with measuring things, quantifying things. Um, and we have a big problem, all of us, in the tech community, and as a broader community too, that we, we love to measure things and we obsess on the things that are easy to measure at the expense of the things that are hard to measure. We have, um, it's not quantification bias, it's I called it quantification skepticism because I, I don't buy it a lot of the time just because uh, his argument was that if you, add, if you convert from JavaScript to TypeScript you'll have 20% fewer bugs and Airbnb said 38% fewer bugs. We should recognize that that's nonsense. Um, it's at best a, a horribly oversimplified picture of what TypeScript gives you. Um, it's reductive in the absurd, as if the only reason you might choose one over the other is that the number of bugs that it reduces. Um, but that's the thing that people focus on, because it's the only thing that they can put a number on. And you know, I did a philosophy degree, which is why I mentioned it. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the idea that, uh, that, that philosophy has been completely um, superseded by science is resisted by people in the arts because they recognize that there's a whole category of human experience which uh, exists outside of the realm that you can quantify. So we should recognize that we as humans working in software and development have that problem too. Uh, some of the things that we do and some of the things that we think about are easy to quantify. Some of them resist quantification, and we should pay as much attention to those as we do to the things that are easy to quantify. Anyway, sidebar, excuse me. Um, yeah, so back to the opinions. Um, in relatively free contexts, then, let's think about JavaScript and TypeScript. I put it to you that when there are relatively few constraints, JavaScript's dynamic features are a net benefit because you can even do development just in the debugger. Just put a breakpoint in and just start coding in Chrome 
and then save and your, your app reloads and there you go, you've got all the data in front of you. You don't need types when you can see the data. You know, what, what's the point in telling me that it's a number in the, in the, in the code when you can see that it's three? You know, it's, um, in highly constrained contexts though, the kinds of data that might go through a system are harder to reason about. And so type safety maybe then has more value to you because you can't reason about the kinds of inputs and the constraints that that system might have as easily, so you, you fall back on type safety. So TypeScript becomes a benefit in constrained systems, and JavaScript's dynamic features become a cost. Similarly, test-driven development. I find myself bouncing in my work between writing the tests first and covering with tests and not testing at all. And it depends on my context. And I, it's, it's awful for someone, especially if there's anybody from Code Clan here, to hear that you should, in some cases, not test. And you should, in some cases, test exhaustively every, every, every path that you can think of. Because the problem is no one's going to tell you which one's which, which of those contexts is which. And you have to kind of figure that out for yourself and you have to have arguments with your colleagues. Um, and it, but one way of thinking about it, I hope, is that if you're working in this relatively cost-free scenario where you're playing and experimenting and the code might disappear tomorrow, then the, the cost of tests is real. It's a, test, it's a cost of time. Whereas if you're working in a highly constrained context, the risks of not testing are crazy. You have to test because otherwise you don't know what you, what you could be introducing. Anyway, I, I labored that point, but I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to labor it. Um, <coughs> similarly, I kind of presage this slightly, um, iterating versus writing design documents or, or, or thinking very long and hard about your, your system. Iterating makes, and, and just playing and experimenting makes total sense in new contexts when you, when you have very few constraints. But it makes much less sense in contexts where there's a lot of work already done. And uh, the last one, just to see if I can get a rise out of anybody. Um, so I worked on Angular uh, at Firebase, which I don't know how many m millions of users it has, but it's the hundreds of millions of users category. Um, it has a lot of complexity, but it scales fantastically. You can add 200 uh, developers over there to work on this feature of your, of your product, and the rest of the app will hardly blink. Um, things will just work. Um, you don't need to worry about it. I don't believe that's true about React, though I can't. Very, I can't say that with huge amounts of confidence because I've never worked at that scale on React, and neither have you, unless you've worked at Facebook. <laughs> so uh, if there was somebody from Facebook here, maybe they would know. But uh, I think my instinct is that React has a much lower barrier to entry, but over time its complexity costs are is a steeper gradient than Angular, and that's why people disagree about which one's better, because there's some decision maths going on there somehow. Um, but yeah, anyway. So uh, that's me. Uh, in conclusion, uh, your opinions aren't wrong. That was just me being stupid. Um, your opinions are much more constrained by the context than you can write down on a tweet, or you can uh, say um, between a sip of beer or, and a second sip of beer. Uh, so give yourselves a break, give each other a break, and try and get into the context in which people are making those opinions, rather than tell people that they are wrong. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Thank you.